Welcome to the Thin Places Travel Podcast, where we discuss places where the veil between this world and the eternal world is thin. I'm your host, Mindy Burgoyne. I have a little phrase, I call it an enigmatic landscape shrouded in myth and legend. A burial place of royals. A place where you can make a direct connection with the land, with the deities, with the people of the past. Um, It is just well, well worth a visit. Everybody is welcome here. Coming up, we'll hear from Mike Crohan of Rath Crohan, a complex of ancient archaeological sites in County Roscommon, in Ireland. It's also the traditional capital of the province of Connaught and an ancient royal site where the royalty of Connaught would have been crowned. Now, Rath Crohan is a complex of 240 archaeological sites with 60 of which are national monuments, and they spread out over a tract of land that's about four square miles. And the sites range in date from Neolithic times, you know, the Stone Age, maybe 5,000 to 7,000 BC, to medieval times, which would be about 5th century and up to the 15th century. In this complex are burial mounds, um, ring forts, and enclosures. There's linear earthworks, which would be possibly... Uh, the earth carved out in ways where people can process. Um, And there's also a very special cave in the complex. It's located near the village of Tulsk in County Roscommon, and it's known to be a royal site and the ancient capital for the province of Connaught. On the last podcast, we talked about royal sites and what the tradition with royal sites was. These would have been sites of ritual and gathering and sites of massive deposits of human emotion and energy. And when that kind of human energy is connected to the natural elemental energy of the land, what is connected together becomes greater than the sum of its parts. I believe that human emotion and energy, the energy that is created by that, impacts the energy of a place. And perhaps where Rath Crohan is, perhaps way back before people started gathering there, there was an inherent energy in the land that drew people there, knowingly or unknowingly, making them want to mark that out as a sacred site. And as the human rituals and gatherings imprinted their own energy on the existing high energy of the place, a thin place is born. Now, Rath Crowen certainly is a thin place. And while it may not be as well known as the other royal sites, like the Hill of Tara or Amon Maha up in, in Armagh in the uh, Ulster province, or the Rock of Cashel in Munster, or Ishnuk, uh, which is another ancient site, it's remarkable in its own way, Rath Crohan is. And the energies there are often palpable. And we're lucky enough to have Mike Crohan here today to talk with us. He lives right there near the site, and he's going to give us his insight um, into this special place. Well, hello, I have Mike Crohan here, and he is the last Crohan on Rath Crohan. And today we're going to talk about that site. Um, it's a site in Ross Common. Mike is um, he has an archaeology background, and he does lead tours around Rath Crohan and Kesh and Karakil, that region. He's one of our guides. Um, he's highly recommended by us. And Mike also has a photography business, which is what he does with his life now. High end, does music videos, TV commercials, and he also has an aerial filming company. So welcome, Mike. Glad you're here. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And let's talk about this special site. I can't remember how mm. I found uh, Rath Crohan, but I don't. I wouldn't say it's a site that is highly promoted. It's more of a a site, a, a, an amazing site, with, but it's really kind of uh, hidden. I mean, it's sort of a well-kept secret in the big masses when it comes to the guidebooks and the places people go in Ireland. Talk a little bit about it. So, yeah, Rathcrohan, um, extremely interesting place. And, uh, it's a cult centre. It's the oldest and it's arguably the best preserved of the ancient royal Celtic sites that we have, not just in Ireland, but in Europe itself. 
Um, like I say, a cult centre. It was a place um, from before prehistory that was used for uh, sacrifice. It was used for um, political gatherings. It, it was a, a place of uh, shared consciousness for the early people all over Ireland and beyond. Um, at this stage, it seems that it's it's kind of um, keeping itself to itself. It's never been as well promoted as places like Tara or Ishnuk, but it has um, a huge importance in the uh, in the lives of the people who live around here. Um, it has a huge importance for the archaeologists, uh, but also for the spiritual traveller, and is well well worth a visit. And tell us what it's what is the landscape like? What does um, what happened at Rathcrohan? There was a multitude of uses for the area. Um, from an archaeological perspective, uh, we have evidence of people living and using the area from the Neolithic period. Um, those were the first of the uh, the farmers. Um, they came after the hunter gatherers. They decided that it was a great idea to put all the strawberries in one place and fence them in so they didn't run away. Do the same thing with the pigs and the cattle, just just to keep an eye on them. It was an easier way of uh, gathering meat. But from the Neolithic, you come through the Bronze Age, you come through the Iron Age. And, you know, we're talking two or 3,000 years ago. We have evidence of people using this site both in a ritualistic um, way, but also in a social way and in a political way. So really, it's had a myriad of uses um, over the years. But the overriding sense and feeling is that one of the spiritual use of that landscape. Hmm. And when they, this was the place where um, the royalty of Connet were crowned, right? A royal site, was it now? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. From, a, from a political perspective, yes, it would have been a place where the king elect um, would have been um, through a due process would have been inaugurally um, inaugurated. He would have been ceremonially uh, married to the goddess of the land. Um, the idea there being for uh, continued uh, good fortune and fertility and, you know, just so that people could get through the seasons and just bring in a little bit of good luck by uh, marrying into the gods and the goddesses um, of the landscape. Right. And when you walk onto this site, which you, I, I think you know, I didn't know what to expect when I first went there. But it's kind of like the Hill of Tara and that there are these mounds, you know, there's, it's just fields mm. and there mm -hmm. are these mounds. Um, and, and when you contemplate how long those mounds have been in the landscape, it's kind of daunting. Um, it, we don't have anything like that in America. We don't, we, I mean, we have some things in the West that the indigenous people kind of carved into stone, but the, the actual earthworks, the, the way the earth was shaped to accommodate the, the setting mm. Um, is is quite amazing. And don't you have, I, I think I remember there being a standing stone or two out there, maybe it had fallen down. Yes, the uh, the actual uh, landscape and the monuments and the earthworks that are up there, um, it's the highest density of earthworks anywhere in Europe. They're all over this landscape. But for the visitor who's looking at it for the first time, they may be a little bit confused in as much as we have a glacial landscape here. Uh, in the west of Ireland. So you have all these natural um, hillocks and rounded shapes that the glaciers left when they last retreated about 10, 10 and a half thousand years ago. So when you mix those natural shapes in with the remnants of the monuments um, that sit on the landscape, when the visitor looks at it for the first time, it can be a little bit difficult to distinguish um, some of the monuments from what is a natural landscape. But if you just allow yourself to relax and just contemplate that uh, that landscape for two or three minutes, one by one, you see these monuments starting to appear in front of you. Not magically, but you, your eyes just mm. uh, tune into what's there. Now, having said that, the main monument on Rathcrown, uh, the main mound, is so large that you could not miss it. It is 80 metres across. It's it's between five and 10 meters high. It just dominates the landscape. What did they think those mounds were? Have they ever been excavated? Or are they just made up hills to crown people on? Or what do you think? That's, 
That's a very, very good question. And uh, the answer I'm happy to tell you is from an archaeological perspective, there's been very, very little in the way of intrusive digs. Now, that means that the, uh, the integrity of this landscape is still completely intact, which is something that you cannot say about uh, the Taras or the Donorlanders or the Awamachas, which would be some of the other royal capitals in Ireland. Rathcrohan, it's still buzzing. The energies are palpable up there. It's a place um, that is as it has always been. It's a place where you can walk in the footsteps of the ancestors and you know that you're walking in exactly the same place and on the same surface to a degree that they would have been done, uh, that, that they would have done. And it's just, it's a complete area. It's a complete monument. Wow. And what about those standing stones? Have they fallen over? I think there's one laying on its side, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a few that are being kicked over. Um, now, whether that's being done just through um, age and attrition from the weather or... Possibly this could have been done by the new faith um, where they were looking to uh, take away the powers of the uh, the, uh, the, the pre-Christian um, people and the, the, the powers that, you know, that had been uh, put into the landscape there. Um, there's standing stones, there's uh, stones which the archaeologists would class as recumbent, which means they've fallen over. But, but yeah, we, we do have standing stones, we have circles, we have burial mounds, we have barrows, long barrows. We we have more styles of monuments than you can shake a stick at. Wow. And tell us about the uh, Cave of the Cats. Ooh, very, very special place to an awful lot of people, Mindy. So a place I will never see because I am entirely claustrophobic. <laughs> and just for the listener, you have to, this is not a cave. A cave to me is a big giant space in a rock. You walk in like Kesh Karin, but this mm-hmm. is a hole in the ground that you slip into, uh, sort of drop into, and then you are in this, oh, we've sent guests in there with Mike and they've come out saying it was just an amazing experience. So why don't you talk about that cave, its history, and why people want to go in there? Okay, yeah, no problem. I mean, first of all, let, let, let's let, let's put things into context. You know, um, have you ever locked yourself out of the house and had to climb in a window to get into the house? I have. It was not pleasant, but I have, yes. Well, there you go. This is... <laughs> all right, there's no windows in the cave. Yeah, but, but, but here's, here's the thing. Um, it's not the largest of entrances. But once you get into the cave itself, you're looking at something that's about five meters high and maybe three meters across, you know. So uh, it's 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 not really claustrophobic. It just has that appearance of being a, a bit of a squeeze. But what is the cave? Well, it depends on who you are. If you're an archaeologist, you would say it's uh, it's a space in the ground that's been used by various people over various periods of time throughout history and prehistory. Um, if you were a geologist, you would class it as a hydro-eroded fissure, basically. You know, this space that's opened up underground due to um, erosion by water. But the majority of people who come to Rathcrohan, it's the entrance to Mother Earth. Okay? It has another tag, um, the new faith, the Christian faith, for classed it as Ireland's entrance to hell, but Ah, uh, sure. You know, <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be yourself. Um, but at the end of the day, it is the epicenter for Celtic spirituality in Ireland. It's the home of the Morrigan. It's the home of the goddess Maeve. It's a place that, at special times of the year in the Celtic calendar, such as uh, Belts and uh, Samhain, you know, May Day and um, Halloween, the veil between our world and the other world becomes so thin that people can pass through. That means that allows us to travel from our world to the other world, but it also allows people um, from the other world, people of the she, people of the mounds, the fairies, um, people of the spirit world, to travel through to our realm. So there's a phrase that I use on a regular basis, which sounds a bit poncy, but it's known as an axis mundi, which is a pivotal place between our world and the other world. Mm-hmm. Um, when the majority of the um, the travellers, the walkers, people are on a spiritual quest, when they come to Rathcrohan, um, that would be kind of the highlight of their journey because they appreciate the importance of it. 
So lots of people ask this question. I never know how to answer it because I'm not an authority. Um, but mm-hmm. they're curious uh, about this whole people of the she fairy world, otherworldliness, the concept of non-human spirits or <clears throat> or kind of putting a, a conscious frame around something that the conscious mind probably can't really even understand. So when you mm-hmm. talk about uh, the cave of the cats um, – and you talk about the doorway into a, a portal, so to speak, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. a place where uh, you're in, you can exist in both worlds. If somebody said to you, well, what's this whole fairy thing? Uh, what would you say? Um, okay, flippantly, I would say, what do you want it to be? Uh, because it's it's so many different things to so many different people. Um, I think what, what we're talking about are energies which would exist um, in various different forms and different guises. If you're, if you're to talk about fairies, um, you're, you're talking about the same thing as gremlins, goblins, trolls. Um, when, when you look at different uh, belief systems, the majority of them um, do have a realm which is uh, not fully understood by the uh, by. by by you know the uh, the people who are studying the uh, the faith or following the uh, the creed or philosophy, it's it's a kind of an, an unknown quantity. But in reality, what we're looking at is we are looking at natural energies that have existed um, in a form in a past uh, time, which are still palpable today. So it could be. Use an example, let's say if you throw a stone into a a lake, you see that stone going in, you see it plopping into it. But then the ripples um, from that stone work their way outwards. And that's an energy from that stone, which in 20 or 30 seconds, a person who's standing on the side of the lake can look at and feel that energy as they see those ripples coming towards them. Okay, so to a degree, that's potentially what it is. In the um, in the Celtic um, pantheon of gods, we have so many gods and goddesses, and the majority of those um, attributed to the uh, to the landscape. They're they're gods of, and goddesses of nature, and um, in in the cave, we have so many of these uh, deities um, dwelling. And when people go on their own personal search. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to work out their own spiritual direction and feeling. They can go into the cave, and for a lot of people who have um, the right frame of mind, who approach things in the right way, and when I say the right way, it's only ever what works for that person. When they're attuned and they're relaxed, then they can make a connection with these deities, with these gods and goddesses. Um, they're known as the people of the she, and in the Irish, she is a mound. And a good example of one of these um, entities or deities would be the one that so many of us have heard of is the Banshee. You know, the Banshee is sometimes um, attached to a certain family and in times of um, impending grief or doom, the Banshee will wail and a member of the house will hear this and they'll go, oh no, we heard the Banshee, now something bad is going to happen. If you take a step back from that situation and look at it from a slightly different um, angle. What's actually happening is um, that banshee, and that translates as a woman of the mound, is actually trying to tell you that something's about to happen. So steal yourself, just prepare yourself. You know, there's going to be a change in the family. Somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to be born. So do you have a a special uh, place in Ireland or anywhere in the world um, other than Rathcrohan that you you think is uh, you have a special connection with? Are you pretty much just tied to your homeland? That's a really good question. Yeah, I I, I was going to say I have to admit, but I don't have to admit anything. Um, <laughs> the fact is that I'm kind of myopic in uh, my views because there is so much uh, work for me personally to be done on Rathcrown that if I, if I was to try and uh, start understanding um, to the degree that I want, want to understand Rathcrown, if I tried to start understanding all the different sites in, in Ireland, my head would explode because there's just so much in this country. So I feel that my uh, my work is, uh, my time is, is best spent um, just doing what I do every day, which is living the land, living on the land, working with the land, 
walking the dogs around the area, stopping, listening, looking, and just trying to get a handle and trying to understand this specific landscape that's in my backyard. Right. And you, your family is a farming family, right? We were. We were very much so. Um, back through the generations, I mean, um, we, we, we this country is not great for keeping records for, uh, really prior right. to the 1700s. But I do know that my family has been here since the year dot. Um, we uh, we got the surname Crohan um, from actually, you know, living and working on uh, the Rath Crohan landscape. Now, just out of a, as an aside, uh, Rath Crohan um, translates into the Irish as Cruhorn. And that means, when it's translated into the English, it means people of the conical mounds. And when you, you're on Rathcrohan and you're looking around, a lot of the, uh, the earthwork shapes that you're going to see are like upturned saucers. They're burial barrows from the Bronze Age. And they are, in, the, in essence, they are conical mounds. So that, that, that's, how we, that, that's how we got our name. That's great. That's great. So you... So you're happy there and oh, yeah. tent on Rathcrohan. Well, why not? It is a it is a beautiful sight. No I'm doubt. the luckiest man in the world. You are. I really, I, I genuinely, <laughs> I, I do know that, and I, and I say it to anybody who will listen. And even if they're not listening, I'll run up and tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been very lucky to have you today. Um, is there anything you want to say before we sign off? No, really, Rathcrohan. Um, what can I say? It's I have a little phrase. I call it an enigmatic landscape shrouded in myth and legend. Wow. A burial place of royals, a place where you can make a direct connection with the land, with the deities, with the people of the past. Um, It is just well, well worth a visit. Everybody is welcome here. Um, it's also it, it's worth mentioning, Mindy, that um, the uh, a lot of Rathcrohan was actually it was in private hands, as are the majority of the monuments in Ireland. Um, they sit on private land, but the monuments themselves are um, looked after by a government department uh, called the OPW, which is the Office of Public Works. They bought the Rathcrohan. Um, main mound they bought that land about five or six years ago and they have done a most phenomenal job in just tidying it up taking old stakes old bits of wire out old remnants of uh, farming practices and very very carefully they've just allowed the landscape to breathe again they've allowed it to flourish and anybody who does come here uh, if they don't have a good experience, if they don't get a good feeling, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so you can you can reach Mike um, on the web, and he does have a website for his tour business, which is what is it, Mike? It's www as always rathcrohantours and we'll have that in the show notes so you know how to spell Rathcrohan Tours. And then your photography business, what are those websites in case people want to reach you there? Mm, okay. Um, I have uh, two. Um, one side of my business is uh, aerial filming um, for TV productions. That's uh, www.airview, A-I-R-V-I-E-W dot I-E. And if you'd like to see the kind of uh, photography that I do, which is, which is mainly kind of uh, high-end uh, music bands, uh, gigs, that kind of thing, that's www.raven, as in the bird. So it's raven.photo, P-H-O-T-O. So that's www.raven.photo. Okay, good. Well, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I will see you in May. Mike is a guide on our, one of our May tours, and <clears throat> our first tour is going to Rathcrohan, so we'll look for. I guess that's when I'll see you, Mike. I'll see you when. Hey, we're, Mindy, it's we're, always a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's always, always a pleasure. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. All the best. Take care of yourself for now. I just want to add to Mike's commentary here that the first time I visited Rathcrohan, I was by myself. Um, then I went with my husband. And then I went with a group of friends. But the best visit was when I went with our small tour group and Mike Crohan was our guide. Um, He was quite amazing at taking us around the complex, which is very big and can be overwhelming if you haven't been there before. 
So a guided tour does make a difference, especially with a place like Rath Crohan. But I do want to tell you a little bit about the site uh, from the perspective of traveling to it and tuning into a thin place. And where is it exactly? So if you if you uh, look at Ireland like it's a big giant teddy bear where the head is Ulster and the two hands are counties Mayo and Galway and the feet are the lower peninsulas of Dingle, Avera, and Berra, um, Rathcrohan would be right at the heart, just a little bit northwest of center. It's not on the coast. It is inland. It's very, very agricultural looking. It's in the province of Connaught which is also known as the Wild West. You know, the landscape there in the West is much more wild than it is in the East, and it's much less populated. And when you pull up to the site, it would be easy to miss it. Because unlike the other royal sites, there are no great cathedrals sitting on the top like at uh, Rock of Cashel or the big entryway like the Hill of Tara. Rathcrohan is a series of uh, farm fields, really, And if you didn't pay attention, you might miss it. What's so wonderful about that is this ancient site is pretty well untouched. When you walk onto that complex, you're walking onto the same land that uh, these people were on thousands of years ago, using it as a royal site or a place of gathering. And while the land has shifted, certainly, in those years, the bones of the old ancient site are there. And they are relatively untouched. So it's a beautiful example of an ancient site. Um, there is a large mound. This is something that, as Mike said, it's it's quite noticeable. In fact, that large mound, that's where the parking lot is and the interpretive signage. So that's a good place to start. Um, it is a great place to start, actually. That's where I've started every time I've been there. That mound is so big that you could put my house on it. That's how, when you stand up on it, and there's an easy way, you know, access for you to walk up to it. If you tune in there, uh, stand on that mound, focus on your breathing, imagine the energy of the earth coming right up through your feet and into your body, and then let the thoughts that are racing through your mind fight them, make them leave, and just notice the details around you. Now, that to me is really what about tuning into a thin place is about, is connecting with the earth, being in your body, and noticing the details. What do you see in the landscape? Do you see any other mounds? Do you see any standing stones? Do you see the curve of the earth? Does it, does it look any different? Is there a special tree around? Those are the kinds of things that lead us to other things. So if you... Listen with your emotions and with your intuition and your gut. You'll have a much richer experience. And that large mound is a very good place to start. Remember that this is a royal site and it's associated with Queen Maeve, who is a giant figure in Irish mythology. If you've um, ever read the the trilogy, you know, the, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, Maeve is very prominent in those stories. She's a strong female uh, royal character. And the whole site, really, to me, with Rath Crohan is a very feminine site, has a lot of feminine energy about it. Uh, and Queen Maeve um, would have, this would have been her place of, of, of her palace, her ruling, where she would have ruled from. So they think. Um, I learned to douse on Rath Crohan, and Mike Crohan taught me. He showed up with these dousing rods for all of us there on the tour and showed us how to walk across the landscape. And even our greatest skeptic, who didn't really believe in any of this stuff. He just accompanied his wife on the tour, and he liked history and archaeology, and he certainly enjoyed the tour, but he wasn't really a fan of thin places and that concept. She was. But even he felt the pull of the dousing rods and said, wow, this really works. But the energy pull is so strong in the Rath Crohan complex that if you ever wanted to douse, this would be a good place to start. Even the pendulums, um, swing uh, on on Rath Crohan. So the energy lines are are probably quite strong. 
Rathcron is also known as Mike referred to it as the, the place where the, of the people of the mounds. And I want to just explore that a little bit too, because it is, it is very much associated with that, that, that Samhain, Halloween, the, the portals to the other world, that is a common association with Rathcron. And when we start to talk about stuff like this, language really fails us, unfortunately. You know, and then the, the um, words like leprechaun and fairy and sprite, gnome, goblin, when we say these words in our language and, and, and as Americans, they sort of conjure a meaning of silliness or superstitious or childish, things of fairy tales, not real, certainly. When I think of leprechaun, I can't shake the Lucky Charms guy um, off the cereal box. But these these references to these beings had a very strong meaning uh, pre-Christian. And there was a belief that there were beings in another world, an alternate reality. And these were some of the names. Then if you look at other names like witch or crone or hag, they were deities in pre-Christian times. Those references were of goddess women, wise women, um, why uh, spirits of women and yet they're kind of demonized now and they're associated with evil now angels are okay i mean angels is the same kind of thing it's a non-human spirit a heavenly spirit perceiving the other world to be heaven but it's the same concept it's non-human spirits in a, a parallel world or a an alternate realm so wrath crohan is a place where these realms kind of intermingle and these beings are said to be present so it's also a good area to walk um, and concentrate on that concept you know what is this all about are there other worldly beings the the Samhain association or, or halloween uh, association is very strong so we know that we get this feast of halloween that we celebrate here in america from the old Irish Samhain, when there was a belief that all of the portals into the other world all opened up on this one day or night, and the spirits of the other world walked the earth. And so people stayed at home. Um, they were fearful of being sucked into the other world. And Rath Crohan is associated with that. The mounds of Rath Crohan opened up, and the spirits of those buried there would walk the earth or the deities buried there would walk the earth so it does have that uh, sort of otherworldly association in fact wb yates even made a reference to the kruhan of the enchantments so it's legendary and there's one very special place in the complex that mike referred to the onagat or cave of the cats it's an entrance into a limestone cave that, that's you have to be taken to it it's it's kind of hard to find on your own and it is quite muddy when you get down into it but our guests that experienced that were so overwhelmed by it i remember one of them saying you could not use your senses when you get into this cave you can stand up and you can move around as mike explained but you can't see anything and you can't hear anything so you're totally dependent on your intuition, which could, uh, could certainly frighten people if their imagination gets the best of them. But if you focus and center and pay attention, you can feel that full experience of the otherworldliness. In fact, Mike called it the Axis Mundi, the, the place where the two worlds are commingled. So this is a powerful, powerful place of energy. If you like traveling in thin places, and that's a good one to experience. My sense of it was the energy there was palpable and it frightened me. And I am claustrophobic, so going through that, um, that opening, it is kind of like going back into the womb. There is a certain, you know, you're going into the earth. In fact, I did read that the, the area above that opening once was a big mound and that earth was relocated during the you know the farming time but it was meant to look like you were going into the earth back into the womb of the mother into another existence as well as your present existence so that cave of the cats 
when I first saw it, I thought it was, it radiates, it vibrates with a kind of an energy. But I did not enter. One of the things I did not know until I read up on this prior to the podcast is that cave was short. The entrance was shored up by people. It looks just like a stone entrance. And the lintel stone over top of the cave, you know, the head of the entrance, is an old Oam stone. So that's O-G-H-A-M. These were tall stones that people would write on in the old Irish language. They would write uh, vertically, starting at the bottom on up to the top of the stone, just little notches and dashes from the old Irish alphabet. And this Oam stone has, when, when it was translated, the, um, the translation read Freach, son of Maeve. And Freach was actually the son-in-law of Maeve in the Irish mythology. So people think that perhaps that stone was in the field somewhere, and when they went to use to shore up that opening to the cave, they just reused it there. You can see the, oh, I'm writing from the inside of the cave, or you can see pictures of it on the internet. We'll have some links that you can take a look at. But that concludes my commentary on Rath Crohan. It is a wonderful site to go see. And if you want an introduction to using your intuition and tuning into a thin place, that is a great place to start. I'm going to conclude with a recommendation. Um, And this week, I'm going to recommend something that took me a long time to get used to, I had heard about this place and totally dismissed it, as I noted, because of the language. It's called the Leprechaun Museum. And when I first heard of the Leprechaun Museum, I thought, that's got to be a silly place. And I never went. Um, So I went for the first time last year, and I was so pleasantly surprised. Rather, I was amazed at this place because it's actually a museum about the other world and the traditions associated with these otherworldly beliefs. Um, It's run by very competent people. There's a great staff of storytellers. Their displays are great uh, and and quite advanced for a museum. So your experience in going in there is to sort of travel with a storyteller guiding you through the years of the Stone Age on up to the present, understanding the mystical nature of the Irish perception of the other world, you know, or the mystical nature of this world. And there is even, they're open every day from 1030 to six. It's about, I think, 15 or 16 euros to get in. We'll have the link in the show notes. But they also have on Friday and Saturday nights what they call a dark land tour, twisted tales from the darker side of Ireland. So it's a much more um, sort of scary experience about uh, beings of the other world that may not be as friendly. So I would encourage you to look that up. It's right north of the Liffey, um, a few blocks from the old post office, the GPO. You could walk to it from there, but it's definitely a worthwhile uh, visit. And kids would like it too, although they don't let children on the, the one in the evening. That's adults only. So I want to thank you for listening to the Thin Places Travel Podcast this episode. And if you have any questions or thoughts or travel stories you want to share or sites that you'd like us to feature, you can find us on the web at thinplacespodcast.com. Just click the contact link. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash thinplaces. And you can find me on Twitter at, at Travel Hag. If you'd like more information on our tours, you can visit the thinplacestour.com website. Um, and if you enjoyed this episode, I ask you to please give us a quick rating or review on iTunes, especially now when we're in our beginning stages. That will mean a lot. We hope you'll subscribe. Um, and in our next episode, I hope you'll join us. Our guest will be Moira Hanley, and we'll be talking about Glenda Loch and places in County Wicklow. So, so long for now. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to check out our tours to mystical sites at thinplacestour.com. The music for this podcast is Native Spirit, performed by Cheryl Ann Fulton from her collection, The Once and Future Harp. Goodbye for now, wishing you love and light and every blessing.